Okay, so as promised, we're going to start with talking about the commenting um, so that you guys get familiar with it. If all of you try to comment at this exact moment, you'll probably bring the site down. So this is something that you can just do during the course of, of your work today. Uh, but the mo number one most important thing about commenting is you have to log in first. right? If you make your comments without logging in, I might miss them and not see that you actually commented, in which case that won't help your grade out. So make sure you log in before you do the comments. Okay. Um, commenting's very, very easy. Um, if I were to pick on something, and again, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily matter whether it's for the morning class or the, the, my evening class, we're all going to be mixed, so they'll comment on yours, you can comment on theirs. But let's say I picked something like this, uh, and I wanted to talk about this particular post. If I scroll down, there's a section here for comments, and it, currently there's no comments on it. And all I have to do once I'm logged in is click, and it's going to say who I'm commenting as. That's perfect. And then I'm going to go ahead and type something about this particular post. So in this case, uh, I might say something like, um, I like your background image, but um, it conflicts with the text of your name and makes it hard read your name. Consider changing the position of your name or the background image. Something like that. right? Again, something constructive, something that's trying to help somebody make something better. Okay. Once I'm done, I'll go ahead and post the comment. And it'll say submitting the comment. Um, if you try to comment too quickly, it'll flag something and say you're posting comments too quickly. Um, once you're an approved commenter, it'll show right up like it just did for me. Okay? If you have a picture that's associated with your account, your picture will show up next to your comments. Okay? Um, if, if you haven't associated a picture yet, it's not the end of the world. So what you'll do is you'll go through and you'll make several of these for each exercise, three to be exact. Okay? And we'll do three for each assignment. So thus far, we've had two exercises. Okay, so there should be six total comments. So you'll take your time, write six total comments. Again, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, for the morning section or the afternoon section, they'll all count. Okay, does that kind of make sense? It's pretty easy. Uh, the biggest thing is to stay on top of it. If you get behind and you have you know, 30 or 40 comments to do, it's gonna be a pretty daunting task. Right? If you do a couple each day, you'll stay on top of it and it won't be a problem. Okay, are there any questions about the commenting? No? Big thing is remember, if you haven't commented before, it's going to take me a little bit of time to approve your comments and make it so that your comments will show up. If you've already been in one of my classes, you don't have to worry. They'll, they'll show up automatically. OK, so let's switch over and uh, move into lecture mode for today. Um, today we're going to start with an introduction to photography. And do you have a question? Yeah, so how many are They're not due today, per se. They're due by the end of the semester. And so each time we add an exercise or each time we add an assignment, you add three more. So thus far, we have six comments that are due. At the end of today, there'll be nine comments total. Does that make sense? Yes. OK. So you can, in my world, the easiest thing for you to do would be to comment for whatever the previous class was when you come in the next day. right? So it's given everybody enough time to post their work. Um, so you come in today, you make comments for what we did last week. You come in on, on um, Wednesday, you make comments for what we did today. Does that make sense? Right? It makes it easy. You only, the maximum amount you should have to do in a day is six. Um, and if you stay on top of it, it won't be, it won't be particularly hard. There will be some um, exercises that we do that won't require any comments. I will be very specific about you do not need to comment on this exercise. It'll be at the end, uh, the, the very last sentence of the exercise. So thus far, everything we're doing, you do need to comment. Okay, so. Today we're going to start with an introduction to photography. And I think it's important to start um, with photography, even though technically speaking, photography is a little outside of the realm of the world of architecture. I think it's peripherally related. Certainly there's going to be a lot of time where you go to a particular site to do a design, and you're going to need to find a way to, one, capture the site such that you can kind of study it after the fact and, and look at it and decide what is appropriate um, in terms of a building to go on the particular site, etc. And so what you'll do is you go to the site and you'll take a bunch of photos. 
right? We could take this one step further. Once you have a design, it'll be nice to collage in how your new building thing um, fits into the site and what it looks like in that context. So you'll collage your new object into the old photograph. So it becomes kind of an integral part of the architectural world, though it's not directly related. Right? You don't have to be a great photographer to be a great architect. Uh, but because it's related and because uh, we need some, some raw materials to work with in Photoshop, today we start with an introduction to photography. And I'm going to give you, if, you've, if you haven't already read the exercise, an assignment or an exercise to go out and photograph a bunch of things. And in doing that, you'll learn a lot about photography, but you'll also have the raw materials for next class when we deal with the, the introduction to Photoshop and the basic post-processing techniques uh, that we're going to start using in, in, in Photoshop. So we have to start with a definition of terms so that we're kind of on the same playing ground. Anybody in here a professional or uh, very competent amateur photographer? Right? Don't be shy. Okay, A few of you. Okay, I, I've taught this class before where I've actually had a professional photographer in the class. It was a little awkward to give this lecture um, when it was a little bit more like, hey, do you want to come up and, and lecture on this? Um, because she, she, that's what she did for a living. So um, I am not pretending to be a pro professional photographer, nor uh, am I trying to say that this one lecture substitutes for a full semester length photography class. However, I think I can get a lot of the basics done. And if I succeed in one thing, uh, that will be to take you off of the auto mode in your camera and into something a little bit more specific. So let's talk first about something called a camera body. Um, your phone is technically a camera body. If we look at traditional cameras, digital SLRs and something, it's a little bit easier uh, to explain that. The camera body is a life, light proof box. So if I take the lens off, it looks something like this. It's a light proof box. When I put the lens back on, right, it blocks the light from coming in. So I can control what light comes in. Inside of that is a light sensitive material uh, in the old days, which barely qualifies anymore. Um, probably most of you don't even remember this. There were things called film cameras that had film inside them, right? And that film was a light sensitive material. So when you exposed it to light, it exposed a particular picture or recorded a picture on that piece of film. In this day and age, we have digital sensors that take the place of that, such that we read what light comes in through the light proof box that is the camera body. Okay? Aperture is a circular opening that allows light into your camera. And this varies widely depending on what camera you have and what settings are available in terms of how large this really can be. The important thing is that it controls how much light can actually get into that light proof box or can be um, cast on that particular sensor. Um, so it also controls the amount of the final image that's in focus. We'll talk, some, talk about depth of field in just a second. Uh, the smaller the f-stop number, the smaller the depth of field. Um, f-stop is our way of referring to what aperture is. The weird thing about it is it's an inverse relationship. So the aperture, the opening, is actually big when the f-stop number is small. Okay. So let me, uh, let me pull out a live example, because sometimes walking around with a live example helps, if I can find it. Sorry, everything's kind of a mess in here right now. OK, so here's a lens. Uh, this happens to be a 50 millimeter fixed lens. And you guys might be able to see, as I, as I show it around, there's a little itty bitty hole. Can you see the little hole? Maybe a little bit? There's a little tiny hole. Okay. So that is a very small aperture or a high f number, or a high f stop. Okay. So if light were coming in to this lens, not very much light would actually get through because that hole's little itty bitty. Right? If, however, we change, can you see it now? Right? So there it is small, there it is big. Okay? When it gets really big, a lot of light can come through that lens. Okay? So let's say, let's, take, let's put a hypothetical up here. If I had a really dark room and I was trying to take a picture, would I want a small aperture or a really big aperture? Big, right? Because I want a lot of light to be able to come in and hit the sensor. Okay? So that's one of the, the kind of key things. Now, if we look at our phones, right? if you look really carefully at it, you can see in the center Right? There's a little, little bitty tiny glass thing. Right? In between, behind that, there's a little bitty little pinhole. Okay? So there's a big difference between looking at this lens and how much light can come into the camera and looking at this lens and how much light can come into the camera. OK? 
Okay? The truth is that most of us use our phones now anyway, okay? but it still matters. Right? And the better performing cameras will have larger apertures to let more light in to begin with. So I mentioned briefly that depth of field is something that's affected by aperture. Okay? So what depth of field is, is the amount of the final image that's actually in focus. Okay? So if we look at this example with the leaves, right, we have a nice leaf that's in focus here, nice and sharp, but everything behind it is blurred out. Okay? That's depth of field. We have a very shallow depth of field. Okay? Here's another example. Right? And I have some specs down here. This was shot actually with this lens, the one that I just showed you, okay? at f1.8, so wide open, really, really big aperture, okay? 1 60th of a second. And we get the, the very tips of the flower petals in front in focus. Everything else behind is blurred out. Okay? So this can be a very desired effect. This can be something that you want to have happen uh, in your particular uh, photograph. It might not be. If instead of shooting something close up, right, I wanted to shoot something where I had a big landscape and everything needed to be in focus, stuff that was reasonably close to me but also reasonably far away, obviously I wouldn't want to shoot this way. Right? I don't want the depth of field. I don't want the shallow depth of field. So I would be doing the opposite. So in this case, the aperture is an f-stop of 8 right, as opposed to 1.8. Remember, that means it's much smaller. Okay? And we have basically this California coast, everything in the foreground here, all the ice plant and everything, the flowers, they're in focus. I know it's hard because it's the computer's you know, projector. It's not perfect, but you get the idea. right? The cliffs here are in focus. We go back, and it's all in focus. That's the idea behind this. So depending on what I want to show in a particular photo, I'm going to choose what kind of an aperture I want to be using. Right? And there are ways of mimicking this on your phone. Uh, obviously, if you have a camera, there's, there's much easier ways of getting through it. So here's a great slide that I found online that kind of walks us through with an aperture comparison at the bottom right? with what happens to the photographs at the top. Right? So we have a tape measure here. I'm going to walk through it with the largest aperture or the smallest f-stop. Right? This is an f1.4. Uh, my camera only goes to an f1.8, so the examples I was showing you went to 1.8. If I had a different camera, I might be able to get to uh, 1.4. So in this case, right, we have the tape measure. This is where the focal point of the camera is. And you can see that I have an extremely, extremely thin depth of field. Right? So only the thing that's exactly in the center uh, or the exact focal point is going to be in focus. Everything in front of it is going to be blurred out, and everything behind it is going to be blurred out. And you can actually see how wide the blur starts to get. Okay? Now if we look here, we've moved up to an f2. Right? We get a little bit more depth of field, but it's still pretty shallow. Okay? As we move over, you can see we get more and more. Right? We're at a 6.3 now. Right? Much better. Here we are at an f10, a lot more. And then we get all the way up to f16. We almost have the very front of the tape measure and the very back in focus. So you can see how this changes over time depending on what settings we use in our particular cameras. So the next factor, we've done aperture, which results in depth of field. The next factor is something called shutter speed. And I think of anything, shutter speed is probably the easiest for people to understand. Shutter speed basically is how long am I allowing light to hit a particular, uh, that particular light sensitive material or in, in a digital camera, the sensor. So this, the shutter speed is generally um, given in fractions of a second. Okay, So a typical shutter speed might be a 1 125th of a second. So it's a really short amount of time. Okay? Um, it's going to deal a lot with how do we capture motion in a particular, or anything that's moving. Okay, So in this particular example, 1 50th of a second, right? Again, this is not a photo I took, but at 1 50th of a second, and if we look at this, we can see some of the individual droplets of water, right, as they're falling, so they're kind of frozen, right? We can see the, the ripples in the pond, we can see a lot of the details, right? If we move forward, 1 10th of a second, those individual droplets that we saw before, 
right, are now starting to become streaks. They're still relatively distinguishable, so we have like just a single streak here and a single streak here. They haven't merged together completely. The ripples are still relatively apparent at the bottom. Okay, if we jump forward again, oops, wrong direction. Half second, okay, those individual streaks are now starting to blur together and become almost like a mist of color, okay. The, 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 the ripples at the bottom here are starting to even out. We can't distinguish them quite as easily, right. And we're also starting to get kind of white that's overexposed up here in the rocks, right. Obviously, the, the longer this is, this is happening, the more we're going to see. Okay, so then we move forward to one second, one whole second, right? The, the ripples, obviously this is completely blurred, okay? The pond is starting to become very flat. The individual ripples aren't there anymore, right? And this is starting to get very, very overexposed up in the, up in the rocks. Okay, another example here, just to see how things compare. 160th of a second, the spray is frozen. Right, when it's hitting, if we look at four seconds, so again, it's a, it's a big jump in contrast, right? Almost entirely blurred, all the motion. We don't see in the, any bits of that spray when it's hitting the log, right? It's, it's essentially the same image, just one has a lot of blur to it. Does that make sense? So if, for example, hold on one second. If, for example, we were photographing somebody playing a sport, right? Would we want a really fast shutter speed or a really slow shutter speed? Very fast, right? Because we want to freeze that frame. Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, over here, I was trying to save the shutter speed uh -huh. and make it longer, but I found that even in dark lighting situations, it's still not going to get to the same level of blur that it would in a dark situation. We will get there, okay. but it's a combination of other factors. Okay. So you have to change, for example, if you're going in full manual mode and you want to change the shutter speed, right, you have to also change the aperture. And if you don't change the aperture, you'll end up with a very overexposed or a very underexposed. But we'll talk about it a little bit more as we get forward. There's a relationship between them. Okay? So the, other, the next thing is called ISO or film speed. And this is a total holdover to the days where you used to go to a drugstore and buy a piece of film. And the film would come with an ISO rating on it that would determine what, uh, how sensitive the medium was. Right? So you might go and buy ISO 100 film for like standard stuff, but if you were shooting sports or something, you might go buy ISO 800 or 1600 or something. So it's a little bit more sensitive of material. Well, in this day and age, we have digital cameras, so we can choose to have the sensor be more or less sensitive to light. Um, the, the problem is that it can result in these kinds of images. How many people have taken an image like this, especially with a cell phone? Right, where you get all these random little dots and speckles and whatever. And so what your cell phone is doing is it's trying to compensate for the fact that the, the, the little tiny camera is so small right, that you're in a dark room and you want to take a photo. It says, well, I can't get enough light into the, to the camera to be able to expose this. My flash isn't working or it's turned off or, or whatever. So what I'm going to do is increase the sensitivity of the sensor that's in the camera so that just a little tiny bit of light that hits the camera will show some exposure. The problem is we get a lot of what's called noise with this. Wrong colors show up because the, the camera sensor is being too sensitive. Right? It's not doing an accurate job of picking things up. Depending on the camera, we might be able to get up into the ISO 1600 range. Right? This is an example of uh, an ISO of 1600. Um, there's just a little bit of artifacting, but it's not enough to be too discernible. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the different ISO ratings. Um, this was shot. This was a, a Canon power shot camera that was doing it. So if we look here at ISO 100, there's almost no noise at all, right? So it's a very reasonable compromise. Okay. As we come forward, ISO 4, 400, that's eh, pretty reasonable. We're starting to get a little bit of noise up here in the ruler, right? If we move all the way over to the end here at an ISO of 3200, you almost can't read any of the text. You can't see anything off of the, the ruler here, right? And that's because there's so much noise and pixelation coming from the high sensitivity of that particular sensor. So depending right, on what settings you have on your camera, you can achieve more or less noise uh, as a balance for lighting conditions. Okay? 
So white balance applies only to digital cameras, and this has to do with what color is white. Right? And we think, well, wait a minute, white is just white. Right? Well, in the, the photography realm, white can be kind of blue, or it can be kind of orange, or it can be pure white. And that's going to depend on the lighting in a particular scene. Right? So in here, for example, if we were, if we were thinking about this room, right, we have the light of the projector. So in this case, it's, it's kind of whitish neutral light. We have light coming from outside, most of which is reflected, which is bluish light, because it's reflected off the sky dome coming in toward us. We have fluorescent light, which has its own color hue. Right? And so if I were taking a picture in here, we'd be combining all of those lighting conditions and trying to discern what is actual white. Right? So if you look around at somebody wearing white today, right, and you look carefully, you might say, well, like your white looks a little blue to me okay, because of the light conditions. Well, when we're taking a photograph, we can choose, is your white a little blue? Is it pure white? Is it a little bit orange? So how many people have taken a photo that looks something like this? Right? Wait a minute, I'm underwater. Okay, well, not really. Okay? The correct exposure would be the one on the right. The correct white balance, excuse me, would be the one on the right. Okay? So this means that what is white is a little bit shaded in the blue direction. Okay? If we're over here, what is pure white? This is more accurate of what white should be like if we were seeing the, the accurate scene. Okay? The good news about this, yes, it's a problem on digital cameras. Most cameras can automatically compensate for it. Um, so that you don't even think about it. But it's also something that's very, very easily fixed in Photoshop um, without much of a problem. So bracketing is another technique that we'll talk in more depth about when we do our panoramic and high dynamic range photography lecture in a couple, uh, in next, I think it's next week. I think it's the end of next week. Um, and so this is a technique that's primarily used for high dynamic range uh, images, which I'll, I'll explain um, in far more depth as we go forward in the class. Uh, but basically what it is, is you're taking a series of images, or a group of images, that will ultimately be combined together to make one image. And the, the bracketed set, start with an image that's correctly exposed, and then an image that's a little bit too dark and a little bit too light. And the idea is that we can more accurately mimic the lighting condition in a particular room. If I was here, trying to take a photograph of this room, it would be very difficult to have everything be exposed correctly. Right? I could expose correctly for the shadows, in which case everything outside would be completely bright white. I could expose in kind of a medium realm, which would mean outside would be white. You guys would be exposed correctly, but the shadows would be black. Right? Or I could expose for outside altogether, in which case all of you would be dark. Okay? So by bracketing the set, we're taking three images, and then we're going to combine them together. Okay? So you can end up with a high dynamic range image that looks something like this. Anybody ever try to take a picture of a sunset before and you look at the picture afterward and you're like, mm, it didn't really look like the sunset. Right? Very, very common because we're not in, when we're photographing things, we're not capturing high dynamic range. Right? Our eyes see in high dynamic range. And so it's a, it's a subtle difference. We'll talk again a lot more in depth about this and, and what the technique involves uh, as we go forward. So aperture and shutter speed have an inverse relationship. So we were talking about um, you change the shutter speed manually on your camera. If you don't compensate for it, you're going to end up with a, an image that's, that's too bright or too dark, depending on which direction you're going. Uh, basically, if you change the shutter speed by half, you have to add double the aperture for the same exposure level. So assuming you started at the same place, right? if you made the, the shutter speed less, you'd have to increase the aperture. If you did the opposite, it would be the same. What I recommend for people is if you start to get into this, oh, I want to adjust the shutter speed, find the shutter speed priority mode on your camera, and then adjust the shutter speed and let your camera determine the rest of the settings for the proper exposure. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. Okay? So that brings up something called exposure value. Right? And we could look at a table like this, and if we were in a, a photography class, you guys would be memorizing this sort of thing. Uh, but the good news is you're not, so you don't have to. Right? Exposure value gives us, and, and I kind of have to flip between um, slides here. If we were looking at a chart, right, and we said we wanted to uh, be indoor with artificial light, and we wanted to take a photo of like an art gallery, right? we would want an exposure value of between 8 and 11. 
So let me go back here, right? Our exposure value between 8 and 11, somewhere in here, this is going to tie aperture at the top to our shutter speed, right? So we could reverse engineer, right? We're in a gallery. Well, let's say we want an exposure value of 8, and we wanted to shoot um, with a, an f of, I don't know, 8, right? So I come down here, come over here. My exposure would need to be a quarter of a second. Does that make sense for how those come together? Um, so this is a little bit too much for us to do. So generally, we've just let our cameras figure it out. Okay? But I at least wanted to, to, to show you how this stuff works. Taking it a step farther, we have similar. Um, this is kind of ex putting everything together on one graph. Uh, we have different exposure values. It shows us what the apertures are kind of in a slider versus the sharp or frozen image, which is shutter speed, and how those two come together. Okay? So exposure value is one thing. Right? Exposure compensation is something completely different. And what exposure compensation does is it allows us to manually control or make an image darker or lighter on purpose. So our cameras right, automatically expose for a particular uh, what they what the camera thinks is right, okay? And you guys may have done this on your phone. If you click and hold and s drag your finger up and down, it'll do this, right? The same thing. So here we have the standard exposure. That's what our camera thinks is correct for this particular image, okay? If we want to increase the exposure value, we could go from zero to one, and we get an image that's a little bit brighter, on purpose, right? On the opposite. We could go from 0 to minus 2, and we get an image that's much darker. Okay? So this exposure value is basically a way of saying what, what the camera thinks is correct isn't quite correct. Let me compensate for it um, and go one direction or the other. Excuse me, exposure compensation. Okay? So a few notes on lighting. And I think this is, is, this is particularly relevant. You guys are architecture students, so you, you, you will find that you like these sorts of things as well. Um, noon is the most even for light and shadows, right? The extreme ends of the day, right before sunset, right before sunrise, right after sunrise, are long shadows, t generally dramatic darks and lights. Um, I was in a, uh, on a field school in Peru, and it was a combination of architecture students and archaeology students. And we were um, digitally documenting this site that was in kind of the lowlands of Peru. It wasn't up um, in the highlands by Machu Picchu. It was down in the lowlands. Um, it was called Tambo, Colorado. And the site was known for some of the best preserved um, painted walls. Um, and I'll show you some example pictures a little bit later on of what this, what this particular place was. So it was of very high archaeological interest. And so we were, we were tasked um, with going to this site and documenting it. And obviously, the architecture people had a certain interest, and the archaeology people had a certain interest. The archaeology people spent all of their time running around right at noon trying to photograph everything, because it was the most even light, and it was the most consistent way of photographing the walls, uh, the colors on the walls. It was very neutral. Okay? All the architecture people, we wanted to do everything in the beginning of the day and the end of the day, because that's when the shadows were dramatic, and you could really see what the architecture of this place looked like. And we would sit around and not do anything in, in the middle of the day. So it's just interesting that depending on your perspective, or depending on the desired outcome of what you're trying to do with the photography, the time of day or the lighting conditions can really make a big difference. So let's talk a little bit of the technicalities of digital photography. We'll start with file types. The most common is a JPEG. Obviously, we've made JPEGs in this class before, or you will make JPEGs um, very frequently in this class. It is a compressed. Um, image format, which means it's kind of like an MP3 is for music, where there are certain ranges that we can't hear, and so an MP3 compresses those ranges out so that the file size gets smaller. Same thing with a JPEG. Uh, at a certain zoom level, we just can't see differences in color, so a JPEG automatically gets rid of some of that information so that we end up with um, an image that's nice to look at but not quite as uh, high a quality, and certainly is smaller to be able to, to send places or to send in an email or, or whatever. Okay? So it's important to know that it's compressed. Uh, generally, it's about 10 to 1 in size compression. So if a raw image is 16 megs, uh, the JPEG version of it might be 1.6. Right? Oops. Uh, a TIFF is another type of image format. Uh, it is compressed 
uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you've lost data. Right? So we, we, we've compressed it, we've made the file size a little bit smaller, uh, but it can, depending on the settings, retain some of the, um, the full image um, type. It's really popular for coming out of like in a high dynamic range bracketed set of images post-processing. You might go into a TIFF instead of a JPEG. So raw is um, often called a digital negative. And what a raw image is, is when you go out and shoot a photograph, it's every piece of information that the camera captures is stored in a raw file. It's not compressed in any way. It's everything. And so you guys are sitting here saying, why do I really care about this? Well, it does play an impact when you deal with post-processing, especially if you make a mistake when you're out in the field. And I'll show you an example in, in just a second. Okay? Generally, it's, it's at least two to six times larger than a JPEG file. Uh, as I said before, it's not uncommon to have a raw image file in the 14 plus megabyte category versus a JPEG image in the you know, one to, to three megabyte category. So there is a file size difference. Okay? So here's a overexposed JPEG file. Okay? And I took this overexposed JPEG file and I post process it. I did it in Aperture, but you could do it in Photoshop. Right? And I tried to correct it. Right? Notice that in this version of it, right, there's a lot of white that's showing up in here. And I'm not seeing any of the detail. When I do the post-processing of this, I get a little bit more detail coming out of the white, but it, the whole thing is kind of dingy looking. Right? It's not that great. If instead I took the raw image of the same file, here it is overexposed, and I went back and I corrected the exposure and I corrected the levels, look at how much detail I get back. Okay? So by working with the raw images or starting with the raw images, if I make a mistake and the shot is overexposed, generally I can fix it in post-processing. If I'm taking a JPEG, right, which is the most common output from our phones, for example, if I took a JPEG, I can't go back and get this information because it's already been stripped out. So if you're shooting in raw, generally it's a little bit better once you get into post-processing. So let's talk a little bit about your camera. Um, this is generic information, but it's generally similar um, on all cameras. And that is that there is a, some kind of a sensor that's in the camera. And that sensor is sensitive to different colors of light. Um, and generally, there's a, there's a grid pattern that goes over the top of the sensor, such that when light shines through, if it's green, it shows up as one pixel. Uh, if it's red, it shows up as another. And if it's blue, it shows up as another. Right? Uh, we haven't talked about color systems at all in this class, um, but we'll talk about how light works uh, a little bit later on in the class and the fact that you can make other colors from red, green, and blue. So um, if we look at how this works, we have a, a photograph or a scene. The light from the scene goes through the camera. right? It passes in, shines on the sensor. The sensor says, oh, this is the variety of colors that are represented by this particular piece of light translates it into a little digital stream of, of information, and that then becomes a digital file that we can then post-process and work with. Right? Typical compact camera um, should be relatively self-explanatory in terms of the features that are available on it. Um, it's amazing how much cameras have changed and how much now we rely on, on our phones more than anything else. Um, so some of these features are available sometimes on some phones. Right? A lot of times there's also aftermarket applications that you can use that work on top of your phone or your phone's camera to give you finer control over um, what your camera can, can and can't do. Uh, digital SLR uh, is, is essentially the higher end of the camera spectrum. Allows you to change what lenses are on the camera, uh, which can be helpful. And generally they have the largest sensors, can take the highest resolution um, still photos and video photos, or videos. Right? So this is one of the important things. And it's not necessarily available on phones, but on any kind of a, a compact or a digital SLR camera, there are generally preset modes that are available for you to have access to. And what I'd like you to do today, if you can, is move out of the realm of auto and into the realm where you're thinking about using these preset modes. I can almost guarantee that if you move from auto to these presets, your photos will be better just by doing that. Okay? And so let's talk a little bit through it. Obviously, the top one is video mode. Generally, if you have one that looks like a flower, it's for close-up shots. That will then try to focus in the near term on that one little leaf or petal and blur out the background. Okay? 
Night mode is for long shutter speeds. Right, so you want long exposure because the, the scene is particularly dark. Generally, it involves using a tripod or setting your camera somewhere. Okay? Portrait mode is a great mode to use for more than just portraits. The idea of portrait mode is that you focus on a particular subject in the foreground and you blur out the background. Right? So you don't have to take pictures of people in portrait mode. You could take pictures of anything that you want to have a blurry background on. Right? Um, the opposite, landscape mode is the reverse. right? I want to have everything in the photo in focus. So you move into that mode if you want everything to be in focus. It doesn't just have to be a landscape. It could be anything you're shooting. right? There's generally a sports mode. Sports mode, high, high shutter speed, freeze the action. right? doesn't have to be just somebody playing sports. It could be a waterfall or, or something along those lines. Okay. Um, and then you get further down, there might be a panorama mode that lets you um, stitch images together. There are also priority modes, depending. If you get into the digital um, SLR camera realm, you'll have more of these options. If you're using a, a compact point and shoot camera, you'll have less of these options. Uh, these are semi manual modes or semi automatic modes, depending on how you want to look at it. Basically, giving you control over one variable and leaving the other variables for the camera to determine. So if you go to shutter priority, for example, you pick the shutter speed, camera compensates for everything else. Aperture priority mode, you pick the aperture, camera compensates for everything else. And obviously, there's a full manual mode on some cameras. But you have to be a little bit more technical to be able to do that. I don't shoot in full manual mode. Okay. Um, so you want to think a little bit about how big is your card in your camera or how much space do you have on your phone based on Based on that information, you choose what size you're shooting in. Are you shooting in RAW or not, basically? Uh, you want to think about how many images are you planning on shooting? Do you have enough space to, to capture the number of images? Um, I have a tendency to know when I'm going on a particular shoot or going somewhere how many images I'm likely to take, because I've, I've done it long enough. Um, so I'll know, do I have enough space or not? Okay. Um, and then what's the final output? Obviously, if you're, if you're trying to shoot for something that's going to be blown up into a large poster, you want to make sure that you shoot in high enough resolution to be able to do that. Okay. So what else do you carry? Uh, my camera bag is completely disorganized, but um, I, I like to, to at least point out some of the stuff that I throw in there. Uh, generally, I have lens cleaner because stuff gets on lenses. Um, I generally have an extra battery. I have generally have an extra memory card. I tend to have tripods just in case. Sometimes they're little itty bitty tripods. Uh, this one's hooked up to the GoPro, but you get the idea. Right, little itty bitty one, easy to carry. Um, extra lenses, panorama head, other accessories, whatever that might be relevant. Um, you also kind of want to think a little bit about are you allowed to photograph a particular subject? Right? So this could be are you allowed to take pictures in the museum that you're in? Or it could be will somebody let you take them their picture? Right? Which is certainly something to be relevant. Um, a lot of times, people just snap pictures and nobody really cares. Um, but you could theoretically have somebody mad at you if they if you took their picture and, and they didn't get permission. Okay. The other thing is to look at the the weather and plan accordingly because it will rain. Um, so this was in Peru again, but we were up in the highlands this time. Uh, we were hiking up the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu, and guess what? It decided to completely downpour. Okay. Now we had laptops and cameras and camera bags and everything else. So uh, you want to think a little bit about what's your, what's your strategy relating to this sort of thing, and are you, in fact, going to shoot? We, we wanted to take some uh, panoramas uh, up at Machu Picchu, so we arranged it so that we could put a tarp over the, the camera, and we just moved around as we took the pictures just to keep it dry. Uh, so you just want to be aware uh, that that kind of stuff does happen. So let's move forward a little bit more into basic compositional techniques. Um, this is probably the make or break it thing about your photos. If you get the other things right, if you shoot in one of the, the, the presets instead of auto, that will solve a lot of the other stuff that I've talked about in terms of shutter speed, um, depth of field, those kinds of things. But if we look at basic composition techniques, this is really what a lot of times makes or breaks a particular image. It also makes or breaks a particular presentation, um, poster, basically anything else that we're going to ultimately talk about in this class, same things apply. Okay? So there's a variety. Um, if you Google this subject, um, there are, of course, more than I will, will show you here. But I'm going to try to highlight some of the ones that I think are, are most relevant in terms of compositional techniques. So the first one that we'll talk about is something called telling a story. 
Um, and in the telling a story, generally there's something, it's either a lighting condition or a mood that's in the photo that, that explains a lot about what it felt like to be in the particular scene. Or there might be elements in the photo that cause the person looking at the photo to investigate further or to get involved with the photo. And I'll show you some examples in a second. So this is in St. Peter's in, uh, in Rome. And a, a particularly good example of what it's like to be in a church in this kind of an environment or whatever. You've got the light pouring in through the window, and you've got all the people congregating in that, that grouping of light. It's not the best photo in the world. It's a little bit blurry. Uh, but you get the idea, and you get a sense of what the mood was of that particular scene. Okay? Uh, this is in the Swiss Alps. Um, and in this particular scene, if you look at it long enough, Right? You can see that there's a little trail that starts here and that winds its way along this ridge. And if you keep following it, it keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. So it's a way of getting the person who's viewing the photo involved with the photo and wanting to get into the photo and look at it. So it's not just, oh, this is a pretty view. There's something that's leading you through the photo and causing you to be interested. Okay? Another example of uh, Peru. The Andes, um, unfortunately, this is too dark on the projector for you to really see it, but it was a lot about the lighting conditions and what it felt like to be um, in the peaks here. So the next one is called symmetry. And strong symmetry is going to dominate this sort of photograph, but it's also good to have something that doesn't fit or something that doesn't belong with the symmetry to create a good contrast. So this is the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. Uh, very, very strong symmetry in this particular photograph. When I lined up to take this photograph, it was my intent right, to create this dramatic symmetry. Right? But there's something that's out of place, and that is that the population of people is all on the right side of the bridge. Right? Now, obviously, there's a bike lane and a pedestrian lane, and everybody's following the rules and being in the pedestrian lane. But you don't necessarily know that right, from a detail standpoint. But it's the thing that's out of balance. So you can have a very strong symmetrical composition, and then you have one focal point that's out of balance. And that makes a very strong uh, composition. Okay? So something like this, not my image, uh, but we have the couch, and we have kind of the decrepit environment, very symmetrical. But one window is open, and there's a pile of dirt on the floor. Right? That breaks the symmetry. And so when you're setting up this kind of a shot, you want to think about what is the piece that breaks the symmetry in addition to what makes the symmetry in the first place. So another type, this one's particularly difficult to do um, unless you just happen to be in the right circumstances. And that's something that's called radial. It's something where there's a strong focal point in the center, right? And then elements radiate out from it. Um, this is probably the best example that I have. Um, this was, uh, in, again, in the Swiss Alps. It was inside of an ice cave looking out. Uh, and we have this strong focal point, and it happens to be a gap between these two um, icicles, so to speak. But that creates a very strong point at the center of the image, and the rest of the image is symmetrical around that particular point. Right? So it would be a very radi radial um, composition. Um, a tunnel or something like this a lot of times can be the same sort of radial composition, uh, where we have a strong focal point at the end. All, everything radiates to and from that particular point. Right? Another example here, um, inside of a hot air balloon, same kind of a thing. We have a very strong focal point, and everything else comes out of that focal point. It works particularly nice because of the shadows at the bottom as well as a way of breaking that. Right? I don't like that image. We'll move on. So diagonal, um, strong diagonal element captures the attention in the photo. Right? So we might have something like this. Again, macro, very close up shot. We have a strong diagonal that's running through the, the scene, and that might create uh, a focal point. This is over here um, at the book drop off, kind of down below. Um, again, strong diagonal in the scene, contrasted to the, the um, rectangular form boards for this concrete wall. Okay. Another example of a strong diagonal, the train um, stopping with the strong track diagonal. That creates the composition. Overlapping layers is another way. It really tends to be used in an architectural context. Um, this is where we frame one element from another element. Right? We have something in the foreground framing something in the background. Right? So we might have something. This was uh, that place, Tambo, Colorado, in Peru, uh, that I was talking about with the paint on the walls and whatever. It doesn't look that spectacular from these photos. But it has to do with 
we've got a doorway. Through the doorway is another wall with some a niche and a window. Through the window, there's another wall. So we're, we're creating these layers. Right? This is just to give you context of, of, of this particular um, mud dwelling building. Um, another example here, right? based on how the light is showing in this particular image, right? we've got these overlapping layers. We've got foreground. We've got grass. Then we go to the, the water, the pond. Then we go to another layer of grass. Then we go to another layer of pond or ocean or, or, or lake or whatever. And then we go uh, uh, yet again. So we have these overlapping layers that create this. Okay? And so the last one, which can include any of the ones before, but is also extraordinarily easy to, to adopt um, in, your, in your photography or in any of your posters or InDesign projects or, or basically anything else that you do in school from this moment on, right, is called the rule of thirds. And it's, it's really easy. It essentially says, take the image, divide it up into three by three, so we have three regions, and put the action on one of those third lines. Right? So if I took an image, something like this, and I said divide, 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 all the action should occur here, or here, or here, or here, right? Not in the very center of the photo. So let's look at some examples of this. In New York, right, if I were to divide this up, right, there's one line, there's another line. So here's my third this direction, and here's my third coming up from the bottom. Right? It's not an exact science, but generally speaking, it's pretty spot on. And so what happens? Right, is I have a focal point in the image, and I've got plenty of space for this to, to breathe off to the side. Right? Now, it would make a difference. Notice Statue of Liberty is facing that way. I wouldn't want to do this in the opposite composition to where she was facing not to the larger side. So you want to be a little bit careful with how this stuff is set up. Okay? Another example here, in the middle of a rainstorm, right? this point occurs roughly a third over. Right? That boat is roughly a third up. We could even take it a step further. Right? There's a third, there's a third. The horizon line of the end of the lake is about a third too. Right? So we're kind of framing in the action. OK, so here's a good example. Generally in, in the world of photography, certainly when we're with our friends and our family and whatever, we have a tendency to photograph each other. Right? You hike to the top of a mountain, you take a photo. Right? This is common. Okay? And what do you do by default? Right? The person stands in the center, and you take a picture around the person. Okay? It's a very unexciting way of taking a photo. Right? You just hike to the top of the mountain. Right? You're at the beach. You're doing something. Okay? The last thing you want to do is have you independent of the context around. So what do you do? You shift the person. Right? So this is an example, tying shoes. Not a particularly exciting thing to be doing. Right? But if we follow the rule of thirds, right, the person lands a third of the way over. Right? We have context. We have what else is happening in a particular scene. Right? We also have his eye line right at the rule of thirds. So we get looking at what is he looking at. So it's starting to tell a story about what it was like to be in this particular context just by changing how it was composed. Right? If we take the same image and we crop it the other way around, it's not very good. Right? So it still follows the rule of thirds. Right? There's a third of the way over. Right? His eye line is still at a third. But we're capturing this information, which is what he has his back to in the scene. Right? So by just switching how we control, we can activate the scene, create a person that's involved with the surrounding environment. Right? Or we can turn our back to the scene and do something like this. So you want to think very carefully about how you're doing it. So there is a right and a wrong way. Uh, this particular example um, could be a strong diagonal. Certainly there's a strong diagonal in it. But the helicopter falls roughly a third of the way over. Right? Another example here, this is a good depth of field example. Everything is blurred out behind. Right? But again, it falls on the rule of thirds. Right? This is in the lower right quadrant. Okay? So here's the top of the mountain example. Okay? You just hiked to Machu Picchu on the Inca Trail. You want to show context of what it's like to arrive at the Sun Gate. Right? 
which I have to tell you a story about that in just a second, but I want to finish my thought relating to this. So instead of putting you in the dead center of the picture, right, put your, you know, the two of us are roughly a third of the way over, and we get a whole bunch of context about what's happening in the mountains. It's a much stronger way of exposing, okay? So I have to go off on a tangent because I love tangents. So we did this, this trip, we hiked the Inca Trail, we arrived at Machu Picchu. Anybody ever done this? No? Do you guys know what Machu Picchu is? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so Machu Picchu uh, was, uh, was a capital of, of the Inca world. Um, it was built in an extraordinarily difficult place. It's up on kind of the top of a ridge with these giant mountains around you. And to arrive the way that people arrived uh, in the Inca times, not via bus, right? You have to hike this. It's at least a one-day hike. Some people do a four-day hike. Um, it's kind of an all-day hike, and you arrive at um, Machu Picchu via um, a really cool set of stairs and a, and a gate called the Sun Gate. And so we, we had hiked this. Um, you could see what the weather was like. It was this misty, rainy day. Uh, we hiked all day, soaking wet, uh, hiking along, you know, totally exhausted, knew we were getting close, right? came around this bend, and there was this set of stairs, stone stairs. And it was like a ridiculously tall set of stone stairs, and you're exhausted. And so we trudged up this set of stone stairs, you know, carrying laptops and cameras and all the rest of it. We arrived at the Sun Gate, which is at the very top. You crest the hill. It's the first time you can actually see Machu Picchu. And the sun came out and, like, shone through, and it was like this, like, ah, moment. And it was probably one of those, the coolest moments of my life sort of thing. It was an experience that I will never, ever forget. And it was entirely about what is it like to experience this architecture in this context. And it was just mind blowing. And so I encourage you, if you have the opportunity, uh, to travel and see these kinds of architectural landmarks. Whether Machu Picchu is something that's interesting to you or not, it's entirely up to you. There are many, many more of these kind of architectural moments that happen throughout the world that if you are a part of, you will suddenly believe that architecture is important. Um, and so I would just encourage you. So there's my side story. Sorry, I couldn't resist. So there's the rule of thirds, right? Uh, this is up in the, the north coast um, of California, Sea Ranch. I'm sure at some point in your career as California-based architects, you will have heard of or study Sea Ranch. It's right? just kind of one of those things. Anybody heard of it yet? A couple of you, one, right? good for you. <laughs> Um, I promise you, you will study this. Um, this, is a, this is an architectural development that happened kind of in the 60s and 70s. Um, very, very well done. Um, the architecture was, was spectacular. Um, and it, it'll be something that you'll use as a case study at some point in your, in your architectural career. I can promise you that. Anyway, um, so photograph here. Dense foliage at about a third, right? Bottom line of foliage at about a third. The bay is framed then by the upper third. So we get a really nice composition uh, in an image like this. So part of it is just seeing the world through this kind of a context. Okay? So the last one that I'll talk about is framing uh, an image. This is a lot like overlapping layers. Uh, but it's basically you shoot through something such that the context provides a frame for whatever your, your particular thing is. There's the frame. Uh, this is in Pompeii. Right? Patterns and repetition, right? This is kind of like symmetry, where we're looking for something that repeats over and over again, and then something that doesn't fit, right? So we look at something like this, again, very architectural image, over, you know, balcony, 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 right? You see the one thing that doesn't fit? The swimsuit or the underwear hanging on the rail, right? So you, when, you're, when you're looking at this context, you want to see it, right? This is a really cool image because of the repetition, but it's that much better because there's one thing that's out of place. And you want to think about what is that thing that's out of place. The only thing I would have done if I had shot this image, it's not mine, is I would have made the one with the underwear not in the center. I would have made it on the rule of thirds. So I would have been doing the repetition, but also the rule of thirds. Okay? Another example here, right? Um, in this context, we have repetition of columns going down. We have the one person that's out. That, that's kind of blurred walking through. Uh, that, that's the, um, the piece that's out of place. Um, another example here, right? Repetition of this grate, the snow clinging to it is the piece that's out of, out of place. OK, so when we talk about your exercise for today, 
Um, and usually we would take a break right now, but I'm not going to take a break uh, because you're going to have the bulk of the time today off to go photograph. Um, so we're going to push through, and then you guys can take your break afterward. Um, so you have two parts to what you're doing today. Uh, actually, there's more parts, but there's two primary parts. Um, under part one, I want you to browse the internet, and I want you to find an image that you think is particularly good. That is a very open-ended request. Okay? Um, if you're really struggling to find an image, try looking up like National Geographic or something like that, because generally their images are going to be awesome. Okay? But Google Image or Flickr search for this particular image. Uh, I'm not overly worried about copyright infringement on this, because you're going to link to this particular image, and you're going to talk about why the image is good. Okay? Um, <coughs> so in this part, I want you to examine the image carefully. I want you to make some notes about why is this image good, what kind of a compositional technique is the, the photographer using to make this image good, is there anything else about this image that's making it work, is the depth of field shallow or not, right? is the shutter speed fast or not. Okay? All the things that we talked about, what, what is it that makes this particular image good? Okay? You're going to post this image, you're going to write up a little paragraph or some bullet points, Right? There's not a right or a wrong answer. I'm not saying it has to be 100 words or something. Right? It's a couple sentences, but I want you to think about what makes this image good. Right? One of the best ways of making yourself a better photographer is to look at work that other people do. Okay? So I want you to find something, um, write a little explanation of it. I want you to make a post, set the image as your featured image, and make sure you link to where you found the image in the first place. So there should be a clickable link. Okay? Once you're done with that, you're free to go. Uh, I would encourage you, certainly for this class, you've got now an hour and a half, two hours to go out and do the photographs that I'm asking you to do, right? in which case you don't have any homework. You can do it during the class time. My night class, unfortunately, has the challenge of they can't really photograph at night, so they're going to have homework instead. You guys get the benefit of being able to photograph um, at day. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do is use the presets on your camera if you can. If you can't and you're using your phone, which is nothing wrong with that, consider an aftermarket application that gives you more fine control. Um, not, not required, but certainly available. If you're using your iPhone, make sure you go into the options uh, and, and adjust the exposure compensation. Adjust you know, by tapping on the screen what's in focus and what's not in focus. Be smart about this. Create good images. Okay? Um, and you're going to take this list of photos. There should be five photos of campus buildings. Okay, it's, it's written on here. You don't have to write it down. It's all written. There should be five images of people, right? Walking, reading books, whatever, right? I'll leave it up to you whether you want to ask the people's permission or not, right? You can get together with your friends and, uh, and shoot each other, all right? That's fine. Not literally shoot each other, photograph each other, sorry. Um, five detail images of textures or patterns. Right? Five photographs taken from unexpected angles. Right? That one's actually, it sounds the weirdest, but it's generally the best of the group of images that you, um, that you pick from as you go forward. So five unexpected angles, four macro or close-up shots. Right? If you can, one bracketed set of images. Right? If your camera doesn't do bracketing, try to use exposure compensation to deliberately under and overexpose a, um, a scene. If you can't do it, when we get to that particular section of class, um, <coughs> excuse me, you'll have the ability to use a sample set uh, when we do the bracketed set. Also, one handheld set of panorama images, like three images that overlap that you could ultimately stitch together. Uh, again, if yours don't turn out, I'll give you sample images to work with when we get to that section. Uh, one self-portrait or some kind of a background that you might or might not use on your personal landing page that we did last class. And 25 or more images of your choice from off campus or from life in general. Okay. Um, I request that you not go way back in the archives and use images that you shot from um, you know, last summer or something. Um, not quite as relevant. But um, for the interest of post-processing and whatever, you're welcome to use those when we do the post-processing. But you will, on um, Wednesday, you'll get your first assignment. You won't be allowed to use those in your assignment. It has to be something you took fresh. Um, 
And then I threw a challenge at the end. Um, I've always debated, should this be the first assignment or not? Um, thus far, I haven't decided to make it an assignment, but it's, it's kind of fun. Um, take 30 images of your mailbox. Okay, It sounds easy, but I promise you, once you get to about 20, it's really hard right, to come up with the, the remaining 10. Okay, So if you want to challenge yourself and you have a little bit of extra time, um, it would be a great way of, of really learning uh, your camera and, and photography skills. Okay, So just make sure you do that post prior to leaving, uh, and then you're free to go. Uh, take your images. Make sure when you come to class on Wednesday that you bring your camera and or your images. Ideally, bring whatever you need to connect your, your camera to the computer. Okay. Uh, if you have an SD card in your camera, there's card readers on the computer, so you don't have to worry. Uh, if you have your phone, uh, you might be emailing photos to yourself or, or whatever. It's kind of up to you how you want to get them, but, but think through having those pictures available for you. All right. Are there any questions? No? All right.